Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Batcast. Today is April 10, 2020, and I am Rifat Manan, and I'm with my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Emilia Madrigal, who is in Boston. And today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Konstantin Kanakis. So Dr. Kanakis is an accomplished lab professional and a board certified medical laboratory scientist. He has been very actively involved in public health, including arbovirus prevention abroad. And in fact, he's a regular contributor to ASCP's blog for medical laboratory professionals, which is known as Lablogatory. And in fact, he was one of the ASCP's 2017 top 40 under 40 as well. And in fact, uh, you'd be happy to know that he would be joining pathology residency this year in University of Loyola. So today he is going to talk about the laboratory aspects of COVID testing, and we are happy to have him on board. So over to you, Dr. Kanakis. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for having me, uh, both you, Dr. Manan and Dr. Madrigal. I appreciate being on the PathCast uh, channel. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, this current viral pandemic and its testing considerations in the laboratory. Uh, and we're gonna look a little bit at the biology of uh, this virus. And I'm gonna focus more on the specific nuts and bolts of how these tests uh, relate to each other. Um, a little bit about me, you heard from Dr. Manan. Um, I do have some experience on the bench. Uh, I've been working as a medical lab scientist for about 10 years. Um, I, uh, I just picked a few of my favorite things here for you to see. Um, I do some public health work right now in New York, giving some talks and lectures on education, uh, especially during the current pandemic. I have no disclosures to uh, uh, show. Uh, except for the fact that I, I love to use social media to share, teach, and uh, collaborate with my colleagues. You're also going to see a lot of these QR codes uh, throughout the presentation today. Uh, if you want to screenshot them or pause or scan them with your phone, they'll take you to primary source material where you can read more in depth uh, from what I've been talking about. So let's jump in. Uh, these learning objectives, I think, if you uh, leave this talk with any selective memory, I would appreciate if you just remember these six points because they'll guide you through a lot of this stuff. Um, I want all of us to understand the virology and pathophysiology behind this viral uh, disease and its diagnosed COVID entity. Um, I wanna be able to integrate a little bit of this public health global health data into our clinical laboratory practice. Um, I'm going to discuss the FDA's emergency youth use authorization system and how it fits into CLIA regulations as far as scope. Uh, I wanna discuss laboratory developed tests and talk about how we can improve methods and how to improve upon commercially available tests that exist already. Um, and then I wanna talk about that validation application and reporting safety because uh, inspections are suspended right now. Finally, I want you to think about what makes a test good. Uh, in a pandemic, we focus on uh, quantity over quality, but what and where do we draw the line as far as where we can sacrifice quality? Keeping that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the virology of the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 entity. Um, if you haven't heard anything, the next few slides are just a primer to catch you up. If you've li been living under a rock, congratulations, you're practicing excellent social distancing. But just in case you haven't heard about it, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a zoonotic uh, mutant novel coronavirus, meaning that it came from an animal host uh, and mutated and infected humans, starting with bats to pangolins or what have you in the wet markets of Wuhan, China. Um, and as with any virus, it has an attachment mechanism an invasion mechanism, a replication mechanism, and those things obviously make us sick within the realm of virology. Um, going into detail, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about these receptors and some of this downstream uh, 
uh, effect. So there are some fantastic sources out there that talk about uh, viral pneumonia just in general. Uh, this is a great resource called My Pathology Report, which kind of translates this to uh, the layperson about what's going on with the words that you may see in a path report. Uh, this was about viral pneumonia, so I shared it with you. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus attaches to uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptors, um, predominantly present on pneumocytes in the lung. Uh, those inv invaded cells become damaged, they die. Um, type 1s are replaced with type 2 pneumocytes, and we'll look at that under uh, histology conditions. Um, you have your obvious lymphocytic and white cell invasion, alveolar filling, uh, late stage hyalinization and stuff. We'll talk about this specific soon. Um, but, but essentially, you need to understand that viral pneumonia uh, is the predominant clinical presentation uh, with a lot of sequelae that affect uh, a lot of patients and have a very broad spectrum from mild to severe. Um, so how do you go from uh, flu-like symptoms to patients being uh, on ventilators and having to be prone every so often. Well, like with any virus, uh, there's an inflammatory component. With this particular virus, the inoculation uh, is introduced. You're introduced to the viral uh, particle and increased viral load through replication, either from droplet, some hypothesized fecal oral. It's not exactly airborne, but it can be propelled in uh, sneezes and cough droplets. Life on surfaces is a little bit questionable. You'll see a lot of uh, stories in the media that discuss uh, how many hours or days the uh, coronavirus can live on surfaces. But the tests we use to analyze that are really the tests we use to identify viral RNA. So if there's RNA present, they count it as presence of virus. However, it doesn't have a very long life outside of its droplets. So that's a very important thing to remember. After inoculation, our immune response kind of takes over. Uh, its replication causes viral pneumonia signs and symptoms. The immune response gets more severe. Um, you have a whole downstream cascade from the type 2 pneumocytes recruiting uh, macrophages, lymphocytic invasion, uh, interleukins 1, 6, TNF alpha, acute phase reactants, some inflammatory markers downstream to the liver, the kidneys, and other organs. Um, you can even see uh, cardiac enzymes elevated slightly. There's an asterisk by ESR because I want to remind everybody, you can't hang your hat on any specific tests. A lot of clinical material out there says the procalcitonin will be X in a patient with COVID or the lymphopenia is prognostic for this. Well, that might contribute to an overall picture of a COVID-19 patient. You can't really place all your chips on a single lab test. The severe clinical sequelae that I mentioned a minute ago it can start with flu-like symptoms, develop into pneumonia. You can see acute respiratory distress syndrome, diffuse alveolar damage, which again, we'll look at. Downstream effects of those inflammatory markers can cause hypoperfusion, uh, shock, multi-system organ failure, all quickly happening within the span of weeks for these patients. It can go pretty critical. There's a lot of discussion about pre-existing conditions or age, but we'll talk about that too. A recent paper from the New England Journal discussed uh, the presence of a procoagulant state in a lot of these patients. Um, so there are microthrombi. Critical patients have been known to show antiphospholipid antibodies and complications with the clotting cascade. So not only are patients intubated and ventilated for pneumonia considerations, but they're also being aggressively anticoagulated. So this is a multi-system uh, response to a single bug, which is very interesting. So I mentioned the histology. I'll walk you through the normal here. So this is just stock images on the left of normal lung and diffuse alveolar damage. You see some normal air sacs here, normal alveolar thin walled structures. Um, you see a bronchial here, some, some capillaries. Nothing too remarkable here, very open, nice and clean uh, lung tissue. Uh, go down here, you see diffuse alveolar damage with a lot of uh, white cell infiltrate. Uh, some things inside the alveolar sacs, thickened walls, definitely an effacement of the normal alveolar architecture present here. Um, and you can see how this would affect uh, perfusion and oxygen transport across the alveolar membrane. It wouldn't be very good. Now, over in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, a friend and colleague, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay, actually put out a very early video 
uh, urging people to take this COVID-19 entity seriously. Um, and this is actually uh, a slide from a patient there that had uh, this, this viral infection. And this is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome with that same diffuse alveolar damage, a little further progressed with the hyalinization of these membranes, a lot of invasion, a lot of inflammation. Uh, and you can see how these patients really need uh, saturation support. And that's why they get ventilated and have all these downstream effects. So it's a very acute process uh, for a viral pneumonia, but it follows all the expected uh, pathophysiology of a viral pneumonia. So I mentioned, you know, this, this virus has the expected uh, attachment, invasion, and replication cycle. Those ACE2 receptors that are present are its binding protein to endocytose into cells, cause invasion, insert its viral DNA, RNA rather. Um, and there have been discussions about different targets to look at uh, either for risk or treatment, um, different things along this ACE pathway for sure, that talk about uh, ACE inhibitors or patients with hypertension expressing different levels of these receptors or being uh, downregulated because of viral entry um, as potential targets for treatments. Uh, on the other side, every receptor isn't exactly going to be a one uh, player party. So other receptors and S proteins and secondary receptors um, are also being considered as targets. For example, this nemaphostat. Um, which is a current drug, may inhibit the entry as a sort of supplementary protein, but none of this is evidence like proven yet or clinically proven. These are just theories at this point. Um, you're going to hear a lot of things in the media about different treatments, and I'll talk about uh, this one here towards the end. But in the cycle of viral entry and replication, um, there are many targets. Uh, anybody in virology and, and the battle against viral infections knows that you have multiple options when you're dealing with uh, viruses as treatment targets. So monoclonal antibodies may prevent this attachment by neutralizing this SARS-CoV-2 uh, before it even attaches to the cell. Or some other uh, medications may affect the way these secondary proteins allow this viral insertion of its genome. You've obviously heard the Plaquenil, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin pathway for this endocytotic pathway. Um, proteolysis has these uh, antiviral agents that can uh, contribute some considerations as well as uh, for uh, replication and transcription. And um, again, none of these are exactly studied or proven, but the theories are, are holding that, you know, we have this known entity, known pathway, um, and we just don't have enough information yet. But I'm gonna come back to this, so bookmark this in your minds, if you will. This leans a little bit towards the clinical uh, aspect of the entity on sort of floors. I don't wanna get out of the lab too far, but you can see here this um, Seattle Intensivist one-pager uh, from Twitter really summarized everything really early when the uh, pandemic wasn't even a pandemic yet, it was just an epidemic on the West Coast. And he summarized a lot of the biology, signs and symptoms, epidemiology, and the clinical and practical details. Um, talked a little bit about the R0, which is the infectivity rate, uh, fatality rate. Um, he took some data from China, um, talked a little bit about some non-pharmaceutical interventions, we'll, which we will also explore, and then some practical uh, clinical stuff to have in uh, providers' pockets, ground glass opacities, findings on imaging, uh, labs like that procalcitonin I mentioned, um, and then exactly what to do as far as precautions, PPE, and uh, prognosis related to age and other things. So this is a very concise and condensed summary of uh, COVID-19 as a clinical picture. Throughout this discussion, I'm going to insert these, consider the following slides. And what I really want to do is just stop every now and then so we can reflect on some key points. Um, so we've got a rapidly spreading uh, zoonotic mutant novel coronavirus causes widespread inflammation, uh, predominantly respiratory distress problems that can lead to downstream sequelae that are severe if unmanaged. Um, right now, there are no pharmaceutical interventions at all, only symptom management. Um, we're going to talk about testing a lot today, and that's a complex discussion. But the best tool we have right now in the toolbox is keeping apart from each other. Flattening the curve is something you see everywhere, um, and I'll explain that in detail. 
Another thing I want you to consider is that public health data tries to extrapolate on what we confirm, report, and collect through laboratory testing. So not only is testing a complex discussion, but it's an essential and critical service in addressing public health concerns like a pandemic. So let's look at the data a little closer uh, before we discuss testing. How does the scale of public global health fit into the practice of a single laboratory? Well, first of all, this pandemic as defined by the WHO is affecting countries all over the world. Pandemics are lab data driven. Like I said, you have to have testing in order to have people reporting cases. That's, that reporting is key. Um, no reporting means no solutions and no functional outcomes. And without those outcomes, you can't exactly support any sort of treatment regimen or research any sort of intervention at all, um, which is why currently we're, we're stuck with social distancing, which is a good thing, but that demonstrates the utilization of that data in real time. Non-pharmaceutical intervention is really all we have right now. So the pandemic timeline. Way back in the end of 2019, which feels like an eon ago, um, patient zero somewhere contracted a viral case of a mutated version of coronavirus from a bat, uh, from a pangolin, uh, possibly another source uh, into that human in a wet market um, in Wuhan, region of China. After that, in January, case reports to the WHO uh, increased severe respiratory disease, became uh, a growing concern. Fatalities began to emerge from China and other countries that sort of highlighted public health data at a new stage. Um, in February 2020, uh, the WHO established uh, this as a serious concern. Uh, outside of the US, mainly in China and Southeast Asia, cases continued to rise um, and it finally got its nom, uh, name and designation as COVID-19. And the nomenclature is important because we had to address it in the frame and scope of some recent pandemics, which we'll also look at. By March of this year, cases grew exponentially. We started experiencing PPE shortages and panic. Um, media officials and local leadership urged people to stay home. Um, local and federal governments started to intervene with programs. Um, I'm in New York right now, and there's a fireside chat with the governor and the mayor almost every day, giving people updates on exactly what's important. Um, and by April now, uh, cases rise. Uh, social distancing trends become more developed. The FDA has authorized emergency testing uh, for at least 34 tests, uh, updated as of a few days ago, uh, and they have begun to be available and spread out. So the response isn't exactly slow, but it took a little while to get here. So I talk about this a lot in some of my laboratory pieces and uh, with colleagues that laboratory data is public health data. Um, testing, uh, means surveillance, uh, epidemiological analysis, those confirmed versus suspected cases all lead to some sort of analysis and action for uh, functional outcomes. The daily media reports um, can confound and confuse confirmatory cases. Um, that's why it's important to collect data for, for public health from trusted sources. Um, Laboratories are often obligated to report to local public health agencies or the CDC or the WHO, depending on the situation. And those numbers are the ones you can trust. Um, coverage of these, quote, testing failures has been such a mess in the news media and social media that combines too many things into one conversation. And it really is an oversimplification of a lot of regulatory red tape uh, and processes that make testing very complex and important. Um, and the things that make testing complex and important are its critical role in patient care, uh, and that quality and method validation is uh, very important to the analysis of laboratory developed tests or supporting commercially available emergency test kits. So as of the week of April 6th, if you haven't seen this source before, there's a link at the end of the talk. Um, John Hopkins put out this uh, living dynamic dashboard. Uh, this week, 1.4 million confirmed cases worldwide, 81,000 deaths worldwide. Kind of stark and surprising numbers. These red circles move and grow when data uh, is input uh, live. 
which is very, uh, very interesting to follow. Um, like I said, those trusted sources, uh, CDC, WHO, Public Health, um, you can see here that as of that same week, April 7th, just in the U.S., uh, there's about 380,000 confirmed cases and about 12,000 deaths. So we've got our own rather large chunk of the burden of this pandemic. Uh, that exponential growth uh, is very intimidating, for sure. So the public health data as laboratory data informing our real-time decision-making is really about the way labs and public health work with each other. Um, public health officials like the CDC and the WHO operate in epidemiological weeks. So by this most recent week of week 13, um, there have been a certain number of tests uh, done by public health laboratories and clinical laboratories are starting to catch up. So it looks like there's about uh, a 14% uh, rate of positive specimens. Um, some papers from the CDC and WHO and others say that unless you're getting around a 10%, you're not testing enough, but we're gonna get into that, so don't worry. Um, you can see in the bottom there that public health laboratories really led the charge um, first before clinical laboratories started to catch up. And it has a lot to do with uh, regulations and the FDA's emergency use authorizations. So I mentioned that social distancing is the only tool in the toolkit right now, and it works. Um, just from exponential uh, spread, it's a numbers game. If an infected person doesn't infect other people, you don't have that exponential growth that you would have in that early CDC uh, case growth chart. And why is it mathematically important to do social distancing? Well, I mentioned that it's not exactly airborne. So it's surface for a while, it's definitely cough or sneeze in airdrops, but those airdrops fall to the ground. Coughing and sneezing in your arm or your hand reduces the amount of droplet spread. Um, keeping away from people reduces exposure. Wearing masks reduces exposure. Now that's a new recommendation that has changed a lot. Um, but even an N95 can only stop things that are 0.3 microns, and this virus is 0.125 microns. So it's really a numbers game about spread, opportunity, and statistics. This is a representation of a paper that came out after the 2013 uh, SARS uh, epidemic that spread from China, again, from a wet market to Canada and other countries. And if you look at the paper, which you can scan the QR code there, there was a case report of an individual who was not exactly patient zero, but traveled uh, a lot, stayed in a hotel, and actually was designated something called a super spreader. And just in the hotel that they stayed in, they were able to infect a large number of people just from being there, touching things, uh, interacting with people and such. Um, if we were to have implemented some kind of social distancing on that epidemic, that wouldn't have been in the news as much as it was. And you can see the chart that they provided shows a lot of overlap between uh, sociopolitical, ecological, genetic, physical, and intersectional factors between us and pathogens. Very interesting paper. So how do we know if it's working? There are a lot of websites out there that do calculations for us and give us grades. Um, doesn't look like anybody has an A yet, and uh, not to single any states out, but some are doing better than others. Um, but you can see that non-essential visits are going down. Cases are continuing to rise as we sort of brace for impact for the peak of cases. Um, this is laboratory data applied in real time. This is confirmed cases uh, versus other medical data, all compiled into a database which analyzes essential trips, non-essential trips, and COVID cases. Fascinating stuff. So you don't have to look too far to know that social distancing works. If you look at the cases in the region of China, which this started in, um, you can look at lockdown and social distancing, which is more aggressively locked down there than it was here. Um, cases did start to decline significantly after that. Um, by date of diagnosis and by date of onset, um, you can see these two peaks and 
there's a little bit of a, a lull right here where all of the people that already had it continue to experience their symptoms and then resolve and then no new cases showed up after this. This is very important data. You don't have to go all the way to China to learn this though. Just a day ago, the CDC reported on a case in Chicago. Um, Non-pharmaceutical intervention is a very important thing. One person went to a birthday, a funeral, and spread it to 16 people and actually led to three deaths. Um, they have patient zero charts where you can see a person here spreading uh, to visit a meal, a funeral, a hospital, a birthday party, and you can see all of these things in real time uh, with relative to the time of when the state and city banned all of these different uh, gatherings of different sizes. So it works. So like I said, epidemiology really is dynamic laboratory and public health data. The news and social media make this very difficult to navigate. And I often argue that our role as clinicians and especially pathologists is to take a lot of this information and make it clear and make it reliable so that people can understand uh, the translational gap between medical jargon and what they need to know. Um, the nuts and bolts of laboratory testing and regulations are complex. And that's what the rest of this talk is gonna be about. Um, why is this pandemic different? Not only did it highlight regulatory issues that we're gonna talk about, but it demonstrates different social determinants of health. There's a lot of metrics that affect different um, genders, races, ages, populations, vulnerable populations, all differently. Um, and those of us who are in laboratory medicine have a unique and timely role to both guarantee the safety and welfare of our patients while preserving the quality of testing for them. So let's get into it. Testing our patients is a complex topic um, filled with regulation, quality considerations, and lots more. So let's talk a little bit about laboratory developed tests or LDTs. Um, the College of American Pathologists and CLIA as a law uh, have guidelines for validating new standards for methods of uh, testing with improvements. Um, a lot of those times they compare something to a gold standard. Now, what is a gold standard to a virus that doesn't exist? Well, that depends on the test you're running. And what statistical data is needed to demonstrate and verify a commercial kit versus a test you make in-house from scratch? There's a lot that goes into it. So when you start from scratch, you have to navigate and be fully aware and versed of all the requirements for CAP, CLIA, FTA, and other things. Um, Validating a test has a lot of considerations for non-FDA approved tests, which we'll get into the vocabulary of. You also have to know exactly what you're testing for, for the purpose of its clinical utility. So your expectations have to be very clear from the start. And then you have to designate who does what. Um, CAP has a role, CLIA has a role, the FDA has a role, if you're in a different section of the laboratory, different professional societies have a role for guidance, uh, accreditation, inspection, and so forth. So when you're working with CAP, um, one of the things in the About Me section very, very early in the beginning was that I am also a certified CAP inspector. So I navigate these checklists, uh, or I can navigate these checklists if I have to. Um, and one of the things about in-house developed tests or non-cleared tests, regardless of what it is, is that the lab must establish accuracy, precision, sensitivity, interferences, reportable range, and metrics that show clinical significance and validity uh, for a test to really perform its intended duty. What do you have to think about when you set out your expectations for a test? Is a test qualitative or quantitative? That is, are you measuring something to have different levels of reporting, or do you just need to know yes or no? As a starting point, do you have to modify something that the FDA has already cleared? Do you have to start from scratch and develop your own version of a test with reagents you bought or something else? Is your test just a better way of doing somebody else's test? Is it the only way of doing the test that didn't exist before and you're trying to get some kind of Nobel Prize? It all matters. But defining everything from specimens, applicability, clinical utility to the results reporting 
really translates to everything you have to think about for making a test. So LDTs are common. Actually, labs that are designated by CLIA as high complexity, they're expected to partake in uh, making laboratory developed tests and improving their methods like we all are expected to improve our quality assurance programs. There are special cap rules and checklists for molecular and micro testing, which this uh, COVID entity falls under. And the evolution of pathways of tests must address laboratory developed testing from scratch versus kits that are already available. And if you're validating a new method versus just verifying something that you bought. Then good laboratory practice and good manufacturing practice are good philosophies to have in mind. And we all practice good laboratory practices if we're you know, keeping up to date with inspections and making sure we've got records and doing things correctly by SOP standards and keeping all our QAQC up to date. Um, and good manufacturing practices are important when you're in the wheelhouse of blood bank, when you're creating split products or radiating or modifying something for the purpose of treating patients. Um, but this highlights a new consideration from FDA guidelines that has to do with tests versus products. Now you can't really uh, designate a laboratory test as an FDA product. That's why this is in this gray zone. A test is really a piece of information that needs to be clinically interpreted by a trained medical clinician. A product is something that can have functional rules that are very important for the safety and well-being of patients, but you can follow them step by step. Um, and it's a very different uh, mode for considering uh, verification and accreditation. So what's available right now? There are lots of commercially available tests. Inserts for those tests provide data starting points and lots of information, um, but that comes with a caveat. So CLIA complexity is a very important concept in how you address testing, and we'll get into that. So everything that's happening right now, according to CAP, is kind of in this gray zone. Everything as far as inspection is halted. Uh, this is a pandemic, there are obvious priorities at stake. So that sort of stuff is on hold. Um, obviously data is to be saved, compiled. And I actually think that some of these FDA emergency youth author authorization tests might later be not good if they're not supported by the right kind of data. And I'll show you what I mean. Small sample sets are really common among these, but they fill the minimum basic requirements. A lot of these molecular uh, nuclear amplification tests or PCR tests for the COVID uh, virus have 30 to 50 specimens on average to prove um, their statistical uh, abilities, which is weak, but not impossible. So we'll go into that. So right now, or as of a few days ago, uh, there are 29 in vitro diagnostic tests cleared under the emergency youth use authorization by the FDA. Uh, there are only five that are limited to in-house only at specific hospitals. Of those 29 in vitro diagnostics, all of them are molecular tests except one antibody test. You can see it highlighted there. We'll talk about that too. But there's a lot of serology tests out there, don't get me wrong but one is approved by the FDA. There's an example here I pulled just out of researching, and you can see if you scroll to page four or five, this test has not been reviewed by the FDA, and that's just one example of many. And here are the five uh, laboratory-developed tests in-house FDAs. Um, they're at specific hospitals, and they're doing great there, um, and, and, and we'll talk about those too. So what's a good test in a pandemic? So let me talk about a couple examples. So the CDC RT-PCR assay was the first one out. Um, it came with some modifications about half a month later, a few weeks later. Their limits of detections are okay, but there's a lot of interference. Um, most institutions that are running this are already supplementing their data with uh, extra samples and specimens to make that uh, their biostats better. Has about a day turnaround time, but you have to have dedicated staff. Um, that's an important caveat here. We'll circle back to that. 
Um, this CDC test is reliable, but it needs skill. It is not exactly a waived or moderate complexity test. You have to be a molecular tech, molecular specialist, or somebody experienced in these methods. And the instrumentation that it runs on, the graphic user interface, oh, man, it feels very outdated. I've seen it, and it's not my favorite, but it works fine. Now, the Abbott ID now. Everyone's heard of this. It came out March 27th. The limits of detection are okay. It was established with about 60 specimens. It loves to boast its five minute turnaround time for positives and 13 minutes for negatives. Um, it was labeled by the media as point of care, but it's not. It's CLIA high, maybe moderate. It's got a 70% sensitivity. People are scrambling for this, but they're running out of cartridges and shortages. When you compare the two, you have a lot more fermentation that you cannot alter. The CDC test is really just anybody's standard molecular stage one PCR that they can work with uh, primers. Um, now those reagents, you can't do anything about the Abbott ones, but when you go back and look at the CDC ones, that RNA's primer, a lot of techs and uh, molecular managers report in uh, discussion forums that, that that's a pretty iffy control. And um, I have a paper that talks about this coming up. So here's two more examples, the Cephid Expert Express and the Celex Serology Test. Cephid came out with its uh, COVID test EUA on March 20th. Now we got lab approval, and this is the only one that got point of care approval. Now, a lot of folks trust this one since it's a cousin to the Cephid influenza test from a few years ago. I've written about it on the blogatory. I think if you follow ZDog MD, he did a video about it. It's pretty interesting and, and it was great when the flute uh, instrument test came out, but right now it's got some worries. Um, it was quickly pushed through validation, studies through application are missing a lot of stuff, but it just meets the minimum requirements as defined by the FDA. Um, it does require a lot of supplementary data. There are inconsistent reports from managers all over the country about sensitivity, specificity, and a ton of false positives. The Celex, it came out April 1st. It's the only currently FDA approved immunoserology test for antibodies right now. Um, it comes with presented validation studies that are easy to read. About 400 specimens were tested. It's got excellent positive predictive, negative predictive value. Um, it does follow different rules than the molecular or micro tests for uh, COVID PCR. Um, but that being said, they did their work. Um, testing is verified with a lot of spike levels of dilutions, tested with a lot of interferences, um, but it has limited applicability for a clinical utility. So let's stop right there. Molecular versus serology. When do you use each one? Molecular is better for diagnosing and confirming. It's got clinical utility right now. Serology is great for testing antibodies, establishing stage, and it's good for public health or treatment utility. How do you clean up this mess? First of all, never trust a test that hasn't had proper validation. If you wanna help a commercially available kit that you've purchased, supplement known viral profiles. That's a gold standard. Supplement with better testing. Uh, help the limits of detection with more samples. Right there in yellow, more samples is more, better, good. I can't put it any more clearly. Also, are you running the right tests on the right specimens? Are your specimens being collected adequately? There's a lot of stuff to consider. The iffy controls I mentioned for that CDC test, there was a paper from Yale that discussed uh, exactly what was the problem with some of those PCR tests. And they looked at PCR tests from different uh, countries and different labs. And essentially, they found that uh, their limits of detection and their uh, overlapping interference things, uh, because of the CT values, their count values of replicants, um, were a little problematic towards the low end. So that's why the primers, that's why the tests interference, and that's why the limits of detection are so critical to prove. Otherwise, you're just gonna do a bunch of tests and get a bunch of inconclusive data. So what's the point of having point of care testing if all this stuff is too complicated? Vocab is critically important. CLIA exempt is okay if it's point of care. FDA cleared is different than FDA approved. And then you have to realize that there are high, moderate, and waived complexities. For point of care, CAP needs you to have 
uh, instrumentation that's waived to moderate. So again, moderate fits in this gray zone of emergency use authorizations um, and other tests do fall under this category. So to clarify, CLIA has a 12 uh, frequently asked question uh, document that addresses how labs can uh, get waivers for testing, sign out remotely, can you test in the parking lots, can you test point of care, can you have other techs or non-trained people do testing, how do I get reimbursed for this testing, does the lab have to be biosafety level two, all are present uh, through CLIA documentation if you go ahead and scan or screenshot that QR code. Now here's a great uh, example of that clinical utility. You can see that RNA is pretty present really early from that viral load inoculum uh, between days one through seven. And you don't really get uh, antibody response until about two weeks later. So while these tests are both great for different reasons, this is why all those tests focus on having molecular tests right away. Well, we're just now getting more FDA tests for this because it has treatment implications. The United States Public Health Service and the CDC have guidance on who to test and increasing and decreasing priority. Uh, scan the QR code for their release PDF that you can put in your laboratory, but obviously they start with hospitalized and healthcare workers with signs and symptoms going all the way down to first, responder, first responders and essential personnel to non-priority and non-symptomatic people. Testing should inform effective utilization. If you've ever heard of choosing wisely, you know that you should order a test with the expectation that that test informs your clinical decision making. Um, there's a great paper that discusses this four prong model of how to approach laboratory testing. And if you think about it, when you've defined what your purpose is for testing, you have a clear mission of what type of tests and when to order and how to use that information. So who do we test and why? I told you about the priority list, but in times of pandemics, uh, breakthrough pathogenic testing isn't like our routine testing. Effective test utilization is really a balance in pandemics between patient care and public health. How do we make those regulations work for us and quality for our patient care? And like I've said all throughout this talk, clinical pathologist roles dynamically expand during pandemics. So what exactly is an EUA from the FDA and how does it fit into CLIA waived versus complex testing with respect to point of care, lab developed tests or commercial kits? And how do you exactly get an EUA application going? So EUAs, according to this uh, chart, uh, must come from Health and, uh, Health and Human Service Secretary allowing the FDA commissioner because of some sort of emergency as defined by them to allow the declaration of EUAs. As of right now, there are uh, a few EUAs out there. Uh, one's about ventilators and reallocation of materials. Four are about personal protective equipment and how to use them and renew them. And 34 are for testing. Um, the last EUAs were issued by the FDA were about Zika, enterovirus, Ebola, MERS, and some other ones. I highlighted Zika because I was actually using this test outside of the US um, outside of the purview of the FDA, which it was great to watch at the same time, uh, different countries dealing with pandemics and epidemics in different ways. So how do you get an FDA? Well, under this specific FDA regulation, um, laboratories that are qualified right now for high complexity can submit a template letter and application on their website. It's very clear and it's very open. They started with public health labs, but now they're open to clinical labs. So what do you need to have ready if you're applying for an emergency youth use authorization test? You have to have all of this information absolutely ready. And this is where that minimum specimen number came from. Their guidelines have recommendations for dilutions and limits of detection and inclusivity uh, with discussions of interference, uh, cross reactivity, and then a minimum positive uh, spike levels. So again, you have to define all those things we talked about considering laboratory developed tests, or if you're especially modifying something that's commercially available. The FDA has the capability to mobilize and empower labs to respond. Navigating that paperwork is not easy, okay? 
But once you're through that application step, the work isn't over. A lot of work has to go into verifying and validating. Just because a test is on that list of approved EUA tests doesn't mean that it's a great one. Everything in emergencies is usually meant to address an immediate need and not long-term quality. So what do you need to have in your toolkit when you're thinking about this? You need to have a good cap checklist on hand. You need to have recommendations and regulations available and a manager who's well-versed in these CLIA and other government regulations. And you have to have somebody that knows how to work statistics. I said before that microbiology and molecular have very different checklists. And that's for a specific reason. The identifications we rely on for microbiology and molecular have evolved recently to include MALDI-TOF, uh, next-gen sequencing, and other testing. Um, with this advancement of molecular testing, it's very important to make sure that our methods are valid, secure, safe, and reliable for the patient. But per government regulations, there are different scopes that different laws address. So the FDA establishes our analytical and clinical validity while uh, CLIA addresses analytical validity. So just as a, a rule, a caveat, laboratory developed tests are high complexity. You can't get away from that. So how do you validate tests with biostatistics? Are you validating or verifying something that's available? Do you have to prove analytic or clinical uh, utility? And what performance specifications like I showed you way back in the CAP checklist in the beginning are important for you? Well, if a test is FDA approved, you just have to verify it. If it's not FDA approved, not only do you have to validate it, you have to establish all the parameters from scratch, like a laboratory developed test. Are you modifying a new or existing test from a commercially available kit? Well, you have to validate from scratch the modification to prove that it's okay. What specifications are important? They're all important, but what we're highlighting here is analytical sensitivity and specificity, which seem to be the very important uh, FDA mandated guidelines for the current EUAs. Now, I validated tests like many of you have, and if you've got an FDA cleared or approved test, it's pretty straightforward. If you're adding a retic to a hematology analyzer, you have a pretty set SOP of how to add, analyze, and record specimens at different levels. But if you're doing a non-FDA approved or a laboratory developed test, you gotta multiply that by almost five to 10 times. Many specimens are needed over a longer period of time with a lot of proof that you can do statistical significant testing. I said statistics too many times for a picture of James Westgard not to show up. And he is obviously known in the clinical pathology world for creating reliable estimates of error from data using biostatistics. Lots of regulations apply. And these biostatistics are able to be considered one of them. A director or manager has to be well-versed and up-to-date in all these guidelines in order to navigate and deal with the complications. What complications? Well, because of the special testing requirements, you have to address certain cutoff values if you've got a qualitative test versus a quantitative test. Something like a kappa value might lead your test to show significance versus chance significance. Comparing your test to a gold standard, well, there isn't a gold standard for COVID testing, but methodolog methodologically, we've got other tests for PCR that we can compare to. Sensitivity and specificity don't change because something's new. And then, is your test better or worse than what's available? Like with the antibody testing. So how do you fix your kit? Check your primers. Do they work? Are there interferences? Is limit of detection good? Do you have trained professionals and your staff versed in this stuff? Verify the manufacturer's data first and then analyze what's missing, if you need to modify something, if you need better conditions or supplies, or if you can just supplement with a lot of in-house data. If you're making a full-on kit from laboratory developed tests or starting with something you bought, you have to have a plan. Don't be afraid of biostatistics, just think of them as another regulation. You've gotta know about curveballs before you start because then it's easier to hit a home run. But if you start from scratch with suboptical metrics, don't panic. 
There are other efforts related to pathology and testing right now as far as COVID is concerned. And we'll talk about that. There's recommendations to stay ahead. I think high volumes are coming uh, despite what the peaks are predicted at. Turnaround sensitivity and reporting is important. Don't let quality fall short uh, and guarantee your deliverables are continuing to meet your metrics. And I think it's important to have a continuation of operations plan for your lab. So let's get into it. Convalescent plasma. This is the therapy that I think most of us are the most excited about um, outside of the pharmaceutical interventions, testing patients who have recovered and have appropriate antibody response that can be passively infused uh, to patients who have the most severe cases of COVID. Um, but this brings up that conversation of good laboratory and good manufacturing practices. Obviously, this is FDA investigational use only, but uh, the defined range of antibody titer and patient eligibility requirements are very important to define exactly what the purpose and outcome expectations should be for transfusing and infusing somebody with this plasma. Very important. Other considerations for pandemics like this right now include high volume evolutions for laboratories. CLIA has different schedules for the different throughputs labs have, but you have to consider all the different things that go into making a laboratory. Reference materials available from multiple sources, and there was an article from last year from Clinical Lab Manager that talked about form and function meeting to have windows and spaces and thoughtful placement of instruments and analyzers to maximize effectiveness and productivity in your laboratory. But beware the turnaround trap. Everybody's devoting more staff to these shortages, but that might mean less time answering phone calls. In a pandemic, every clinician on the floor wants to know, is my patient positive or negative for coronavirus? Who's fielding that phone call? Don't forget about that. And don't forget about the fundamentals either. Pre-analytical testing process and post-analytical analysis is critical to any laboratory test, not just coronavirus testing. Are the specimen and pathway requirements good when you receive specimens? Is your test validated properly? And then do you have middleware trained people? Are you running reports? Do you have good metrics? All that kind of stuff fits into proper lab testing. You still have other patients and other tests. Um, you better worry about your COVID metrics, but all the rules still apply to your other patient testing that's just as important. But for that reason, I think you need to triage tests in the laboratory. A triage tag is a great clinically useful tool in an emergency response, but is this anything but an emergency? Outpatients and non-stats can be freezable sometimes. You can put those off to the side. Obviously, COVID testing gets priority, along with other critical testing, troponins and things like that. Step-down tests are important, and subcritical testing can wait just a little bit. I think you need to triage it's tests also important in the laboratory, to have continuity, continuity of operation plans. Multiple guidelines exist for multiple professional societies. You can scan this QR code and take a training course from the CDC to take preventive action, but you're going to learn that it requires administrative buy-in participation and partnership with a lot of different parties in order to uh, survive an uh, emergency. So we're currently at a stage where multiple institutions are considering plasma. That's great. At the same time, the media is filled with accounts of treatments not rooted in evidence-based practices. What can you do? Well, on our side, we can organize and we can prepare for high volume and we can continue to support our patients uh, charts with 70% of that testable information. Disasters are easier to manage with proper disaster planning. Different front lines look different to different professionals. Now those lines are blurred. Pathologist front line might have looked a lot like bone marrow smears or collections of CBC, uh, QA, QC. Clinical healthcare workers doing rounds have different types of rounds and considerations now. Public health just got a bolus of data. Researchers are working around the clock to find some kind of cure or intervention. Essential workers have been highlighted in the media and leadership has to address effective uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. But we all fit together in a puzzle of healthcare and our role 
uh, as far as testing is required, is to make sure that we provide the highest quality tests, which is our job 24 seven anyway. So I'll leave you with this thought that nothing lasts forever. This pandemic will be over um, and it will change, uh, but it will also change the fact that healthcare is something we should definitely reflect on more often than we are now. And even though we can't see the horizon of this emergency right now, doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, losing the horizon is something I learned in New York City, but you get used to it and you know that it's always there. So I'll leave you with these resources. Um, there's the living dashboard from Johns Hopkins, the American Society for Clinical Pathology, has a lot of information on COVID, as does the CDC, WHO, College of American Pathologists, and the FDA. I'd also leave you with a lot of these live uh, updated websites from the American Public Health Association. University of Washington has fantastic statistical predictions on peaks and demand on the healthcare system. The Association for Molecular Pathology addresses a lot of concerns for molecular testing, as we've talked about. American Public Health Laboratory is a great resource for pandemic response and uh, ensuring your laboratory performs at the highest level. Um, and local uh, hospitals and local governments have obviously stepped up and many have provided uh, COVID and coronavirus uh, updated information pages, as well as resources for uh, people living in various municipalities. So with that, I'd like to thank you and take any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kanakis, for this excellent overview on different aspects of laboratory testing for COVID. Thank you. So let me see if I have any questions for you online. Just one second. Um, Great. And thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure. So just give me a second. I'm going to look at uh, some questions if they're there. Of course, of course. All right, there is one question that I can see. Uh, for serological testing, what are some of the antibodies currently under investigation that you are aware of? Can you say that one more time for me? What are the antibodies? So the question is, uh, for serological testing, what are some of the anti antibodies currently under investigation that you are aware of? Got it. So um, there are two types of serological testing that I've read about at the current moment. Um, one focuses just on IgG and IgM uh, portions of patient response. Um, so testing really patients for antibodies. Um, and then there are very, very few that have focused on serological testing for um, receptor mediated uh, attachment to the actual viral uh, S spikes, um, but they mostly predominantly focus on, uh, you know, uh, our own antibody response. It's a good question. On the same line, there is another question. Uh, the question is, how effective is IgG and IgM testing? Any new information? Um, there isn't any new information except for the fact that a lot of papers being published right now so the clinical utility of IgG and IgM testing peaking uh, at about two weeks, two and a half weeks after uh, viral load is presented to a patient. Um, that being said, the clinical utility of that is being limited right now to uh, therapy monitoring and screening patients who might be available donors for convalescent plasma donation and for 
later studies uh, for patients uh, collecting data just to see prevalence and surveillance. Got it. So uh, there's a question from Emmanuel in Philippines. The question is, to whom do we give the responsibility of convalescent plasma collection? Is it immunology or the blood bank? Uh, repeat that for me. To whom do you give the responsibility of testing? Uh, responsibility of convalescent plasma collection. Is it the immunology oh. or the blood bank? Oh, I see. Plasma collection. Okay. So plasma collection, um, at least in the United States, uh, falls under uh, very strict FDA good manufacturing practices. Uh, testing and having specific uh, cutoffs for antibody titers and patient consent and all these types of things um, usually are referred to plasma phoresis centers or apheresis centers to donate their plasma. So it's sort of in the wheelhouse of transfusion medicine slash blood bank, um, at least in the States. Right, so there is another question. It's uh, what's the protocol for post-mortem examination in a suspected case? So this is a question from Alice in Romania. Oh, wow. Thank you. I have seen many different uh, pieces of literature on this. Um, they, they mostly lean toward uh, refraining from postmortem examination. Um, they may be due to, at least in this country, they may be due to the PPE shortage. I'm not sure. Um, but the consideration is that uh, aerosolization from exposure uh, may be a dangerous component. Uh, I don't think this is something as serious as Ebola, uh, but I do think it's something to be uh, cautious about. Uh, I did see a funny tweet, uh, which asked a program, uh, a pathology program person, uh, are you performing autopsies on coronavirus patients in your hospital? And he said, no, but my residents are. So I know they're still being done sometimes, but I think caution is uh, a wise decision at this point. Thank you, Dr. Kanak. Yes, I think that's all for the questions right now, but I would like to, you'd be very happy to know that, uh, in fact, we had uh, nearly 400 live viewers from all over the world. And I kept a note, and I think we had uh, viewers from nearly 30 different countries, as far as uh, Kenya, Morocco, Malaysia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Turkey, uh, to name a few it was That's really fantastic. a great pleasure and thanks for all of our viewers for joining in over to emilio i think he had something to say yeah absolutely thank you so much you know that was a really informative talk um and to continue on that same vein uh, actually later in the week or next week actually we're going to have another COVID-19 presentation from Dr. Chen, and that's going to be COVID-19 in Taiwan, a pathology laboratory's perspective. And uh, actually, Dr. Chen is going to be participating in a <clears throat> American uh, study of cancer. So that's uh, the Journal of Cancer Cytopathology. They're hosting a cyto chat today, and that's going to be on COVID-19. And it's going to be an international panel discussion. So if if you're around and if you're on Twitter, that's going to be happening in the next hour. Um, so please join that actually in two hours. It's from 11 to 12 o'clock. So if you can join that and, you know, you can ask questions and Dr. Chen's going to be on there. Dr. Faquin is going to be on there as well. He's the editor in chief of cancer cytopathology. And again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kanakis. I mean, that was a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Dr. Kanakis, again. Thank you.